Oh, got quiet. Ooh. Okay, I hate to rain on your parade, but uh, if you guys could scoot up some so that we're a little more of an intimate group. So if you're in the cheap seats, you definitely need to, to scoot up. Judy, join us. <laughs> oh, okay. You get a pass. All right, so, so tonight, uh, like I said, we're going to be talking about the Holy Spirit. And I thought it would be cool, rather than just being a talking head up here, uh, to bring a friend in and invite you into this conversation. So I don't know why, but every time this ha her and I get together, we chat about like 50 topics all related to whether the church, the Holy Spirit, God. And we just like, I don't know, we get excited and ramped up. And I think CJ calls it like nerding out. I, that's definitely what it is, and so I thought, man, it would be so cool to invite you in on that so that it's like you're part of the conversation and it's not just someone speaking at you, but that we're collectively chatting about this. So this is my friend Kelly. She's from Harbor Covenant in North Campus. Everybody say, hey, Kelly. That's so nice. You don't even know me. <laughs> <laughs> They're a very welcoming group. Um, she's from North Campus, uh, Harbor Covenant. She's the head pastor's wife, but she's also one of the pastors there. She does lots of things. Um, and so we'll just get started. If Kel I think no title. <laughs> no title? Is it on already? Oh, it's on. It's so on. <laughs> Hi, I'm, I just feel honored to be here. And like Karen said, when we get together, we were actually telling my friend Grace, who's here tonight too, that when we get together, sometimes our conversations just, it's usually always about God. We don't try, it just happens. We just both kind of nerd out. <laughs> and I really love nerd. God's word. And so... I get excited still after 30 plus years of. Yep. And, it, and it's like we f we'll find something and it could be that we're frustrated with something not being the way uh, the way it should be. But it's never like we leave. Oh, man, I'm so angry. It's more like, OK, how, how can I be the factor for for change? How can God use me? Um, so before we get too far into things, if you can grab a Bible um, if you, or you can use your phones. Uh, but we're going to be looking at John 14. So if you guys, I'll give you guys a minute. Would somebody like to read that for us? A pretty solid reader? Maybe Taylor? Do you want to read it? No? She's like, no way. John 14, and it'll be verses 15 through 28. Malachi, did you want to read it for us? Cool. Yeah. So stand up and you, you want to use the mic? Yeah, use the mic so it's on recording. Cool. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Right on. Uh, you want me to start? 15? Yeah. Go ahead. 15 through 26? 15 through 28. Okay. If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The spirit, of the, tr the spirit of truth, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, because you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me because I live, you also live. You also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in the fa I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them, and show myself to them. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But, Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teachings. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teachings. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your word your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. 
You heard me say, I am going away and I will come back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. Awesome. Man, stellar reading. I love it. Yeah. Thank you, Malachi. Um, all right. So I'm going to invite you guys all into this conversation. I'll ask Kelly, but feel free to chime in. So what does this tell us about the Holy Spirit? Just in the, what we read. And you feel free to, if you need to reread some of that. But what are some things that jump out to you guys? And Kelly, feel free to chime in. Yeah. Um, I'm feeling a little bit nervous because I don't know you guys. So can I just pray for our, I know oh, yeah. you've already prayed, yeah. but uh, this is purely selfish. So no, let's do it. <laughs> so Father, um, together, we, we just say together, we want to be teachable and we want to hear from you. And um, Holy Spirit, we surrender ourselves right now to the power of your word. It is alive and it is active and it transforms us. We want our minds to be renewed tonight as we read these powerful words in this powerful passage. Would you help us to take away what you need us to take away? Keep us from saying things to glorify ourselves. We want you to be glorified through this larger conversation. So we trust what you're going to do tonight in this space. We want to grow. We want to become more intimate in our relationship with you. So would you use this space to do that? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. I needed that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a whole lot of thoughts, but I don't need to dominate. I know that, yeah. I think, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, what, I mean, what are some things that stand out to you guys just from that passage? There's a whole, like, I'll give you a hint. There's a whole list of things everywhere, but like in the very beginning, what are some things that st stood out to you though? Of What does this tell us about the Holy Spirit? Even a one-liner, yeah. Just shout it out. Fear. Yes. Have no fear? No. Always here. Always here, I love that, yes. I love that. Yep. I love that. Yes. Yep. Always. Yeah. Definitely. Thanks, Mike. Anybody else? Thoughts? Different from the world. Oh my gosh, that's so good. Yep. That's so true. Good. Good catch. He not as the not as the world gives to you. He, yeah, and he did. He said that several times in different ways. Thanks, Malachi. Advocate. An mm. advocate. Yeah. Yeah. He's a peace giver, right? And a teacher. What else? A gift. Mm. Yep. I think when I, um, I'm just agreeing with all of this, like, yes, yes. Um, when I read this passage, it's so easy um, in the American church, so not adventure and not... Harbor Cove, North Campus, but the American church, we try to look for a theology about the Spirit through a few verses, and we try to create a theology about something that's so much bigger than a passage. And so uh, when I read this, when I read passages like this, I like to take a step back and read what's happening before, what's happening after, and what's even before that. And so when I look at this passage and I see Jesus in this intimate conversation with his people, with his closest followers, we call them the disciples. They are super concerned, if you go back to chapter 13, that he is informing them that I'm going to go away. And you can't come, at least not right now. So they kind of start to panic a little bit. But Lord, we've, I'm going to paraphrase, we've given our lives to you. For three years, they had been following him day and night, leaving family and jobs. They wanted to leave their jobs because when a rabbi called you, you followed the rabbi very closely. We call it in the dust of the rabbi's feet, close following. These guys were fishermen. They weren't called, you guys. They weren't the best of the best, the top of the top kids in school. And so when this Jesus, this rabbi comes, and he calls them, they did leave their family trade, and they did follow if they were fishermen. And 
Matthew did leave being a tax collector. So they're having this intimate conversation with Jesus, and he's telling them some pretty heavy news. They have been in the presence of Jesus day in and day out, and they have learned to trust him and do what he says, and they've seen the miracles. They are loving their life. It's hard, but they are loving the presence that Jesus offers them. And suddenly, Jesus is saying, and by the way, this is going to happen. I'm going to go away. And they're so confused in the beginning. Jesus is comforting him and them in the beginning of 14, saying, don't let your hearts be troubled, which is what you finish the passage with. He's saying, don't be troubled. My peace, I live with you. He starts the chapter with, don't be troubled. Let me tell you what's going to happen. And they're still confused. So this whole passage to me and this whole story that we're piercing and entering right now is about relationship. And so I'm just going to say this because I'm totally hogging the phone right now. <laughs> if we look at the passage and we try to uh, create a theology based around the Holy Spirit out of just this passage, it will look more like a transactional relationship with God than an intimate relationship with our God. Yeah, and I think something that stood out even with what you were saying and even in this passage is that his ways are always so much bigger and broader and uh, than, than what we have. Like, we have this small thing that we pray towards. We're like, oh, Holy Spirit, God, like, do this. And, like, even in this passage, it's so much broader. Like, he keeps almost saying, like, man, you, you don't get it. Oh, my gosh, we're going back to square one again. Um, like, and even if, if you get a chance, read the previous chapters because he'd been beating the same drum. Like, Malachi noticed that he did it a few times in the passage. Well, if you look the few passages before that, like in 13 and 14, he was beating the drum and probably even further than that, beating that same drum of like, I'm leaving, but um, I'm coming back. And they kept saying, well, where are you going? Why can't we go? And all of that. Um, and then also what stood out to me too is this need for a clean and holy temple. So last month we were talking about the temple, right? Um, and its need for being holy. And then we talked about how the temple is in me, in each of us. Um, and I just love, like, something that stood out to me is in uh, 23, where he says, uh, Jesus answered him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Um, this there, There's an element that we bring to the table that it's not just like, hey, Holy Spirit, come into my life, boom, done. No, man, if you really believe, like, who this person is, you are asking the most holy of holies to be inside of you, inside of each of you, and there's a, we're going to get to that in a little bit, but there's an element, there's a, a choosing of that, but there's also a daily element to that, to allowing the Holy Spirit, the holy of holies to be inside of you, um, and that kind of leads me a little bit to our next question, so... In verse 22 and 24, I'll, and I'll reread it just so it's fresh in our, in our brains, but it says, Judas, not Iscariot, I love how it says not Iscariot, by the way, um, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home within him. I think I said 24. Whatever does, uh, whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. Um, so what is that about? I would love to hear any of your guys' thoughts or Kelly's. Do you, I mean, do you guys have thoughts? I'd love to shout them out if you have them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. in the universe. Yeah. And being founded as a home mm -hmm. really to make it a family to be with as well as a new location for the Holy of Holies. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. That's that. the inference that I get. Yeah. Yeah.
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. Thanks, George. So it sounds like you have the, that intimate mm -hmm. relationship that that intimate name goes with. Anybody else? What are What are your thoughts on the passage? The response. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you guys hear that? that? It kept saying love and obey a lot in there. Thanks, Malachi. That's awesome. Anybody else have thoughts? Kelly? I totally have a thought. I have a lot of thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> you go first. But also, we've been soaking in this passage yes. for months as yep. we've anticipated this. So, of course, we have... We're ready. I mean, like, we got pages of thoughts here. And this is like the downsized <laughs> version. There were more pages. <laughs> Um, so <clears throat> I'm going to read it one more time, but I'm going to put an emphasis on another word. And she, you emphasized the word that we had talked about. <laughs> um, okay, so this, this person, Judas, he says, but Lord, so I love to paraphrase because I just, there's personality behind these words that we sometimes forget about. Um, I'm not going to paraphrase, but I'll read it with tone. So why are you intending to show yourself to us, but not to the world? Mm -hmm. And Sometimes we take verse uh, 23 where it says, Jesus replied. This was a conversation they were having, but we take it sometimes and go, well, Jesus says, if anybody loves me, they're going to obey me. And we turn it into a statement of um, theology, mm -hmm. forgetting this is a part of an intimate conversation. Yep. So Jesus replies to Judas, and of course the disciples are listening, and he says, if anyone, if anyone loves me, he'll obey my teaching. My father will love him and will come to him and make our home with him. And he who does not love me will not obey my teaching. Okay, and these words you hear are not my own, but they belong to the father. Now, if you have a Bible, if you just flip to the left one page, if you're on your phone and you scroll to chapter 12 and you go to verse 37, remember this is one portion of a very large uh, scenario, conversation, experience, 37 says, even after Jesus had done all of these miraculous signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. And then you have the prophet Isaiah, okay? Jesus had done all of these miraculous signs, and still people were not believing. Okay, go back to 14. If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My father will come. We will uh, make our home with him. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. Belief and love and obedience, they are all a tri-sided coin. That's impossible. But <laughs> belief and love and obedience are like inter as intertwined as you could fathom mm -hmm. in our faith. And so if I don't believe, I'm not going to obey. But when I get to know Jesus like the disciples did, I do love him. Not because I'm obeying him, but because I'm responding to his love for me. And as the disciples are seeing this gracious man, humble servant, king of the Jews, they're following into this unknown but discovering some fulfillment mm -hmm. and satisfaction that they had never known apart from Jesus. And so they began to fall in love with this person, Jesus. So they wanted to obey. They wanted to be intimate. And their belief, their faith, it all just began to blossom. And it's the same with us, right? If I make it that transactional interaction, love and obey, love and obey, there's no other way. There's, that's true, but it's not just the transaction. It's an intimate relationship with Jesus Jesus has ascended, died, 
right, rose and ascended into heaven. And he's saying, I'm still taking care of you guys to his disciples. I'm going to give you my spirit. We call him the wonderful counselor. And that's from the book of Isaiah, which a lot of these people knew because they had to study. So they, have, they had either heard of this, that, that famous passage. It's not just famous to us in Isaiah 9. It was a prophecy they were waiting and waiting for. So they hear this counselor. They're thinking, oh, this is still, like, they're still freaking out. Like, this is God. So, well, that was a lot. Sorry. Well, and, it, and I think with that, too, it's interesting because, like, it affects the way we live, like she said. And it also affects the way we pray, the way all of it. Like, we were talking about um, when we were going over this last week, we were saying, like, how a lot of times when we even pray, like, we, we pray, like, we don't even start out worshiping the person that the God of the universe that we are talking to we just start out listing off the things that we are hopefully that will take place like dear God heal this person dear God do this do this do this this and we were talking about how like we can tend to treat God like this vending machine like please give me the things that I'm asking for and when we do that gosh we miss what she's saying is that the, we have a relationship with the Lord of the universe and when we believe he is who he says he is man there there's something that ignites in you that changes the way you live. It changes the way you are, are in society. Um, something that they say in there, like Judas, he says, um, why not for, for everyone? He, what he thought was super exclusive was very inclusive. He, he's offering it to everyone, but says, with that, this is, there is a cost to that. There is an element that you are bringing to the table that that um, kind of I guess can lead us to our next next question um, so in reading this short passage because I know we, there's we have time not, not much time I, I wish we had more time um, so in reading the short passage and briefly chatting about the Holy Spirit what would you say are some of the implications of the Holy Spirit are there any um, and if so what are they I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts Okay, we're done. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ashley. Um, yeah, man. Any, anybody else? That was so good. Yeah, Malachi. Like, this isn't on you. Like, 
there's an element that we bring, but like it, I'm doing the work, not Malachi or not any of us. Yeah, I like that. Um, anybody else? Yeah, Earl. Go for it. I love it. Was it the same before and after what? Can you finish that thought? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'll, can I just speak yeah, to that really quick? Because Grace and I were just kind of talking about this uh, the other day, maybe yesterday. Um, such a huge difference. They're, they're practicing walking with God, right? Adam and Eve walked with God in the garden. The disciples were walking with God in the flesh throughout the narrative of the four Gospels. And when you think about Peter, right, who was like, I'm going to do it my way, right, and have the ear, and whoop, put the ear back on, put the sword down, right? Maybe this was you and me. Was it you and me? Okay. (laughs) Sorry. I love talking about God uh, with everybody. Um, And so was it the same before and after? And as we were talking about this, this is how our conversations go, um, it's like, some people say, oh, I'm so like Peter. That was you and me. Yeah, I'm so like Peter. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm spontaneous and I'm fickle, and I, ah, but I'm passionate and I'm impassioned. And so I picture their time with Jesus. Picture it as practicing walking with the presence of God in their physical midst, okay? And then Jesus dies, uh, resurrects, and ascends into heaven. Who did God, who did he build his church on? Peter. Peter went from being this, like, spontaneous, fickle, I'm, I'm missing the word. There's another word. That, come on, what describes uh, Peter? Passionate. Like, yeah, but, like, and then, like, oops, never mind. I'm good, you know, and, nope, I don't know him. I don't know him. I don't know him. Right? To, I will, like, here, I will, right before in, like, 13 or 14, uh, no, 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 I will, I will do anything. I will follow you. I will go anywhere with you. I will do anything for you. And she's like, well, actually, before the crow. You're going to deny me three times. And he's like, what? Okay, so Peter is this, like, wildly impassioned guy. And yes, Jesus, and nope, I don't know him. uh, Post-ascension, he is a man of God who is confident and assured and fully marinated in the reality that God is with him and God is in him. And he that whole presence of that whole personality did change. And so it's the same with us, right? I can practice walking. My whole life is practice, right? I'm practicing walking with God. Some of us call him father. Some of us can't call him father because we have had such horrific father experiences. Some of us call him friend. Some of us call him Holy Spirit and, and maybe use the Greek language or a Lat- Latino language for Holy Spirit. I call him Jesus. I pray, Holy Spirit, lead me and guide me. I pray, Father. But in my day-to-day when I am walking, I am walking with my God. His name is Jesus, and he shows up in the presence essence through his spirit. And so I need, like you were talking, Malachi, about all three. It's, it's, it's our God. It's the fullness of our God, fully present, not just alongside me. In the Greek, it's the paraclete. Alongside me and within me is the Greek word in that passage. We have the full presence of God dwells within us. Paul says in Colossians, the fullness of God dwells in you and dwells in me and manifests today as the Holy Spirit. Huge change. That was a really, really good question. Thanks, Earl. A really long No, that was awesome. 
it got me thinking. So for me, I think what, when I read this passage, um, to me, the implications are huge. Um, so one thing that comes to mind is counting the cost. It's a costly thing to follow Jesus. It's not, I think sometimes it seems so free. It is free. Don't hear me wrong on that. But I think we think that it's very easy to phone in. And I think a lot of people, we have phoned it in. Um, I think we think if we go to church, we check off the boxes if I serve and do this. And not that any of those things are wrong. But we can very easily check these boxes off and make it feel very routine. Um, a duty. Yeah, a duty. Like, this is what you do. You're, instead of, these are the outpours of what is living inside of me. Um, our lives should look different. Something I was thinking about, too, just today as I was rereading the passages that, you know, I th I look, I think of this sif sifter. Is that what is it called? I'm not. Like flour? Or yeah. Flour, yeah. Yeah. So, like, we always sift things through something, some filter. And in my mind, I think in today's climate, not to get political, but there, would you agree that our kind of world is so divided on whether this or that, and we do, and we sift things sometimes through that. Like, does it fall in line with this? Does it fall in line with that? And I don't think that that's what we were meant to do. I think we were meant to sift things through the Holy Spirit. Does this fall in line with what God's word says? Does this fall in line with what the Holy Spirit is telling me and what I see in scripture? This has to be our guiding force where the Holy Spirit is speaking through this into us. And I and that when we do that, it becomes less about, I, Taylor and I were meeting the other day and we were saying like, we, like I'll, I'll share, like sometimes I deal with loneliness and if that's the leading thing that I'm letting drive my life, I've missed it. I've made it about me and that's the thing that I'm sifting it through. But if I flip it and say, no, God, you, the cost is heavy, but you are so good, mm -hmm. then this becomes what I'm sifting things through the other stuff that I'm struggling with or that you guys might be struggling with, that's not to say that it's nothing, but it becomes faded more and more the closer to the, this holy ground that we get. Um, I, I always think of, we were talking about the other day, like I think of that passage where Peter was walking on water. He, when he saw and paid attention to the winds and the wave, what happened? He sunk, he sank. But when he had his eyes on Jesus, he he was walking on the water and I just think man that is so like impactful and I think it ties into what we're talking to tonight that it it flips everything when, when we truly let in and believe in this Holy Spirit sorry I took up more time no they're right on <laughs> you made that the old hymn come to mind I'm not that old but I'm old that turn your Which eyes you guys know that upon Jesus look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. It's just, re it's, a, it's a supernatural reality, but in our day-to-day -to -day today, we're so busy with everything, and we're so distracted by everything, everything, right? Our Phones, devices, the world. Everything, it takes, diverts our attention. And so it's work, this is the work, right? What does it say, the work of God is to believe? But I need discipline, man. <laughs> or I take Kelly's roads, and Kelly's ideas, and Kelly's, I'll take mine. You name it, right? I just go, and it's like, where did I end up here? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So we were actually talking about building a trellis, and I think that might have been our conversation, too. I can't remember. But when, when spiritual disciplines, you know, this is just like going to be a 20-second spiritual discipline deal. When you build a trellis, it's a rule of life, right? There's been plenty of books written about spiritual disciplines, rules of life, right? And so the, the Greek word that is for the for rule is the word trellis and so if you put a trellis in the ground and you build your trellis it's going to be the design of the plant or whatever it is you want it to grow and look like right so if it's a grid and it's going to come up and then it's going to grow and you're going to taper it here and then you're going to cut off that little guy and you're going to you're going to build a trellis that's going to shape the way the plant grows and so the holy spirit guides and directs me but i have to put the work of listening, of being in his word, of having rich fellowship where we can go deep and talk about loneliness and talk about difficulties of marriage and children and you name it, all under the sun, and the joys of all of that too. And how Christ completes us apart from anything else first and foremost. Oh, I have so many thoughts going through, but I know we're running out of time. 
But it's the Holy Spirit that I have to practice cultivating a mindset for and a heart for. And it's through this that I get to know him. Because it's one thing to say, hey, let's close our eyes and ask God, is there anything you want me to know about you? Oh, wow, a lot of things come to mind that might not be true. But when I say, hey, God, what do you want me to know about you? And then I start reading the book of John, or I start reading one of Paul's letters or something. I, I, and believe me, I love the Old Testament. But if you're not reading that in context, it's going to be hard to look at one verse and go, oh, boy, what do I do with that, right? So that takes a study more than just a quick glance. And so letting his word, man, become a, a, a filter, a sift. That was a beautiful picture that we sift the world, our thoughts, our relationships, and our decisions through makes all the difference. Otherwise, it's my one-way ticket to wherever I want to go. And, and, and I love this. I'm just going to end with this really quick. Colossians 1.17 says, all things were created by him and for him. And so in my Bible, I, I'm a total Bible writer, so forgive me if that you're not. So I wrote me in capital letters, all things, including me. So now every morning I roll out of bed, and before my feet hit the ground, my knees hit the ground, and this is one of my spiritual disciplines I've been practicing for one year now, I say, God, I was made for your presence. I was created by you and for you. And that whole presence thing is related directly to the Holy Spirit that started in the garden and continues through today. The one verse that is repeated again and again and again, but we don't, for some reason, get. God says, and I will be your people I'll be your God, and you will be my people. It is all about this intimate relationship, this walk, that he wants us to engage with him. And it's, it's cultivating the time and the mindset. To yeah, and I think with that, a posture of surrender, too. Like, th these are the response elements, like she was saying. Uh, that posture of surrender, telling almost daily saying, like, okay, Karen, these are the ways, like, that you are putting yourself first. Like, I was telling someone on Sunday, even, like, there were... There was a moment where I was like, oh, that's not what I anticipated. And then, like, I kept making it about myself. And probably no one else saw it, but I, I knew it was going on. And I thought, man, Lord, forgive me, like, for putting myself first as opposed to your will and your plan and making space for you. Because the more I put myself first, there's less space and less space for the Holy Spirit to work. So that posture of surrender and chase, chase this chasing of what we – of uh, of him and not that the line. I think this made me think of, um, so we, I think I'd said it earlier to Taylor and to Kelly and maybe I even said it tonight, but when we, we all have these things that we chase and the line seems to always move. We think if I could only get that thing over there, then I'll, then I'll run crazy for God, but I just need that thing. Well, I don't know if you've had this. I have this often when I get to the, to that line, the line somehow has moved like a mile down and I'm like, Darn it. Well, if I could only get there, then it'll start. Then, and it, it, you're never satiated. The line keeps moving. And um, so this, whatever that is, that pursuit of self versus pursuit of righteousness, that, I think that's the other element I would say is this d daily surrendering and saying, I, man, I, Holy Spirit, help me to, to surrender and to pursue your righteousness and, and realize that you are dwelling in me as opposed to me just kind of making life about myself, my wants, my desires, all of it, filling that thing ourselves instead of allowing the Holy Spirit to do that, which, again, like we said earlier, it doesn't take the, the issue away necessarily, but it doesn't become the focal point because this is the focal point. Um, and I think that would even go into how it's impacted me, and I'll end with asking you that afterwards. Like, for me, this is so impactful. Like, it, it's kind of been a a little bit of a discord with my family, like, they're super um, political, which is fine, I, it has its place, um, but for me, since the last five, six years, I, my, I feel like my eyes have been opened, and that's truly from the Holy Spirit. It changed the way I live, the way I talk to people, the way I interact with people. Um, for me, it's not about what political side are you on or, or why or this and making everything so black and white, which makes it easier for us to, to, to be palatable. But I, for me, I think the Holy Spirit has done a work where he's impacted me like, no, man, that person that you think is less than, I choose those people. 
Um, that person that you've discredited because they're difficult, I choose them too. Um, like just, it flips just everything. I can't even go, we're probably out of time, so I can't go into all the things that it flips, but I'd love to hear, Kelly, what you... Oh, yeah, we're out of time. Yeah. <laughs> I'd love to hear what... Um, in a nutshell, how the Holy Spirit's impacted the way I live. Um, a real nutshell. I became a Christian in 1988, and I was brought up in a Catholic home. I was 18 years old. And I had one of those, oh my gosh, he loves me. Like, like eye-opening, crazy, awakening experiences. That's a whole other story. Um, but I was brought up knowing God, knowing about God, sorry. Um, and for those first couple of years of college, uh, people said again and again and again and again, oh, you're just super excited because you're a new Christian. You're just a baby Christian. You are just all this joy and excitement and passion for God is because you're a baby Christian. And all I, I interpreted that is, so when I grow up in my faith, I'm going to look like you. <laughs> not joyful, not excited, not passionate, ho-hum, ho -hum, mediocre, right? And I didn't know a whole lot about Christianity. I just thought everybody was Christian. So my interpretation from that, that season of my life until now, I took what I took away was, why should it ever go away? He doesn't change. Oh, people change. Mm -hmm. I got my one-way ticket, people think. That's all I need, going to heaven. That's a whole other topic. Um, or they haven't yet learned. Because, guys, in the church in America doesn't do a good job. Ooh, this is really Kelly's opinion. Uh, so I'm stepping over a line. Because um, this is not your church and our church, right? Corporate America at church doesn't do a great job teaching. What does it mean to live a life fully surrendered, a life of repentance, and repentance is not a bad word. It's a beautiful word. It's me agreeing with God about me and him. Yeah. And living in light of his love. So, okay, we just need to wind it down. My commitment was, yeah. I'm not going to, I don't want, I don't want that to, I don't want their opinion of what Christianity is supposed to look like change me. Yeah. And so now I feel like my life is like, wake up. Come on, church. We got to call him. We got a mission. He calls us to us so that he can send us out. So let's come to him. Let's engage. Let's grow. Let's get in the word together. Let's worship together. Let's tell stories about what he's doing and how alive he is in your life so I can be encouraged by your life and vice versa. And let's go out into the dark world. Yeah. And let's penetrate it, not with judgment, but with love. I am so head over heels in love with my God. I want people to see it. And then this really cool quote, this is the last thing I'm going to say, I promise, is... <laughs> is um, they laugh too much on that one. Is, uh, um, go out into the world. Preach the gospel. You've probably heard this. Preach the gospel at all times, but only use words when necessary. That's the overflow of the Spirit, of the intimacy of my the, understanding the presence of God in my life, overflowing, spilling out into the world. And that's probably who you guys are. So I think we're probably preaching to the choir here. And before we pray, like we're going to do something a little different for praying, but may, for some of you, maybe you're at a spot that like, I don't even know if this is real or not. Like Kelly and I were talking and I, I had said like where I got to this spot is like six years ago, probably before I moved, I had said, hey, this is either real or this isn't because I had worked in enough churches to be like, Gosh, everybody does these games. There's rhythms and routines. They're predictable, even if they say they're not. Um, and so I kind of got jaded and thought, okay, this better be real. Otherwise, I'm done. Like, I'd rather find something else that um, was legit. And so for, for me, that start of the journey was just to pray. Be like, Lord, God, if this is real, show me. Open my eyes. And he did. He started to reveal things in Scripture. And kind of lift, lift these scales off my eyes. So maybe that's your starting point. Um, and, or for those of you, maybe it's just a recommitment of like, man, I want, I want that. The, start there, you know. There, I'd love to chat more with you guys. Um, we're going to pray because we're out of time, probably in a negative of five minutes. But uh, I would love for us to pray. I'll pray for her church. But if someone, actually, if someone would like to pray for her church and then she'll pray for our church because, we are not like uh, competitors. We're one body, like the same mind, same everything. So, could somebody would somebody like to pray for her church? You can join us up here, Becky. Yeah, you want to? Here, I'll bring the mic. I'll bring the mic to you. All right. Would you pray with us?
Yes. Heavenly Father, would you be with Kelly and Kelly's church? And we're so thankful that she has come and shared um, her wisdom with you and with us. And um, we pray that we would also be able to share wisdom and um, encouragement with her and her church. And we just ask a special blessing in this world of darkness when there's so many people arguing and divided and things like that. May we focus on you, on what you want, on what the Holy Spirit empowers us to do. And we're just so thankful for these conversations and encouragement and growth and continuing to not have uh, feel like we have the answers, but to continue to grow and continue to seek new ways to enrich our spiritual lives. And may her church grow, and may it continue to grow, and we ask blessings upon them. Amen. Amen, and Father, um, thank you. Thank you for a space like this. Thank you for these individual people that sit in each one of these chairs, that they chose to come here tonight because they take you that seriously, because they desire to grow. They desire to be transformed. They desire that their minds are renewed. And so, God, as, as they continue to spend time in your word, would you continue to renew their minds and transform their thinking? Would you continue to remind them that your presence is with them, that they cannot escape your presence, that you dwell with them, alongside them, and within them, that we cannot escape your withness? Would you wake us up to a withness? that we would long, would you give these guys a longing? For, those, of who, for those, of, those who are here who already have that longing, would you increase their longing to spend time meditating on your word, acknowledging what is true, that you are present? Would you remind them that their hearts, their bodies, their, their, their woes, their illness, the chaos, the pain, you see it all. You are present with them in the pain, and you are continuing to create a masterpiece through their life. So we thank you for what you're doing here in this church. We thank you that uh, you have come and you have chosen to make your home within us. And God, as a response to that, I pray these guys would rise stronger tonight and rise stronger tomorrow morning with a greater calling on their life to go into the world to preach the gospel at all times, only using words when necessary because your spirit, you are having your way within them. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Kelly. Thanks for joining us. Um, so if you have little ones, um, let's go rescue Callie and the nursery, because uh, I'm sure they're like, what is happening? Um, and then we'll keep going on for the rest of the evening in the Friendship Center. So I'll meet you there in a few minutes. <laughs>